Gas masks and hand grenades. 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 <laughs> Hey, hey, what is happening? This is Gas Mass and Hangar Days. I am your host, Jeff, and today I'm super stoked. I am super excited to bring on my guests. This came together rather quickly, a, a lot quicker than most of my situations do, so I want to thank my guests for that. But uh, as I said, I'm pretty excited to introduce my guest today. He's a guitarist, vocalist, primary songwriter for the 80s band, but it's not really an 80s band, actually. We'll get, we'll get into that. 80s band, Zebra. Our Zebra, as I say, are really a 70s band, a band that started in the 70s called Shepherd's Bush, then morphed into Maelstrom, then changed and finalized their name as Zebra uh, in the late 70s, I believe, 79, I believe it was. Um, they uh, happened to go kind of thermonuclear in 1983 with their debut album on Atlantic. It was the, I believe, is still the fastest selling debut album in Atlantic's history anyways. I don't know about the history of recorded music, but absolutely in, in uh, Atlantic's history. And um, especially basically after the uh, the song Who's Behind the Door was uh, premiered on a relatively new music television network called MTV. When I first heard or saw that video, probably like the summer, May or June of 1983, I was totally hooked. And then I got to see these guys actually open during the summer. I believe it was August. I got to see them open for Quiet Riot and Loverboy. Loverboy was the headliner. Quiet Riot was the middle band. And I'll never forget, man. I mean, while I like those two bands, for me, Zebra just absolutely destroyed them. It wasn't even, it wasn't even a contest. They were just that much better. Um, and uh, now, crazily, things come full circle back in November when I finally get to see them again for the set, only the second time in 40 years, which is insane to me. Uh, I got to see them down in Philadelphia. I got to meet Guy and Randy after the show because I was one of those weirdos that was was hanging out in the bitter cold and got to actually talk to, to Randy briefly. And I told him my, that story about the Quiet Riot thing. We're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that when when I bring him on here in a second. But let me please introduce to you, Mr. Randy Jackson. How are you, man? Good. How's it going, Jeff? Good to see you, man. Good to see you. And thank you again for, for doing this. Um, as I said, uh, you know, it's crazy to think back now that we're both old enough for me to go, yeah, back in 1983, I was a junior in high school. And, and the funny part of that is that I'm thinking to myself, you guys are probably dudes in your 30s or maybe even older. Who knows? And you're just guys in your mid to late 20s at that point in time right i mean yeah i think if that was 83 i was 20 20 28 years old at that point yeah and but the thing is you've been slogging for quite a while on the bar band the, the you know the club circuit for years sure. and years and years down in louisiana uh, and then you moved to new york trying to get a, a a record deal and we'll get into that story a little bit and i want to I want to, as a caveat, apologize to you right now up front. You've done a number of these interviews. I mean, you're not saturated all over the internet, but you've done a number of interviews throughout the years. And unfortunately, you have to repeat some of these stories. And I, I very much apologize for that because it's got to be like, oh, God, here we go again. The Doug Morris story or, you know, that kind of stuff. But at least they're easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. So, um. But by the way, how's um? You're up in New York, right? You're yeah, upstate New York, Long Island. Okay. Did you get? Well, did you guys get a lot of snow with the whole front that moved through? Was it pretty? Well, we, got the, we got the most snow we've had in two years. Really? And, yeah, it's still sitting on the ground, and uh, but it looks like it's kind of melting today. It got kind of warm the last. Yeah, it's going to get up to like sixty on Friday around here. So I'm down in Pennsylvania near Philly, and I was wondering how you weathered the uh, weathered the storm up there. I know you guys. We got like maybe seven inches or so. You guys get probably got more than that. I uh, I don't know if we got more than that. It sounds like my, maybe maybe we got just about the same. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so I guess what I kind of where I kind of wanted to start. Well, I kind of wanted to go backwards. Uh, or I'm sorry, before I go backwards, I kind of want to go back to just November when I found out you guys were were on tour, which you were a good portion of 2023 celebrating the 40th anniversary of the debut album, this puppy right here, which uh, I got both Randy and Guy. I miss Felix, man. He ducked out like he was gone. I missed him. He was a ghost. <laughs> so let's <Chase> him off. <laughs> yeah. And then you can tell I'm, a, I'm kind of a rookie at this stuff here. I got Guy's signature, and of course, I immediately touched it and you know rubbed all the rubbed all the ink all over the place. But um, but yeah, so we saw you. I saw you at the Keswick Theater, and you know, Randy, I got to tell you, man. I mean, you guys have been doing this for literally close to fifty years, I guess. Really, um, in seven in what in next year it'll be fifty years that you've been technically yeah. some form of zebra, right? Yeah, fifty years, February of next year. And that's just insane to me. And and the part that's insane to me was um, I was lucky enough to get like a fourth row seat. So I was in heaven. I was like right in front of you. And as a guitarist, I'm like, yeah, I get to watch his fingers. I get to watch, you know I mean? And I just was kind of stunned with how great you guys still sound, man. I mean, your voice is still that falsetto, which you're known for, which is pretty rare in the the, the rock industry to have such a strong falsetto is still very strong and and the interplay of all you guys and guy oh my god man like this dude's 72 i remember you saying from the stage this man is 72 years old give it up for this guy and he's back there playing like he's freaking buddy rich when he was 30 or something it was insane you know yeah guy has been playing like he he just gets better and better and it doesn't seem to the age doesn't seem to wear on him. I mean, what he does is really, really, really physical. A lot more than most drummers. And, yeah, uh, he's he's just kicking butt. You know, he was always kind of a jazz uh, drummer, and uh, he would incorporate that into the rock. And uh, you know, in his solo, you can certainly see you know how like, yep. technical he gets, and you know, he's he's right on the money. It's 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 amazing. Yeah, you hear a lot of a lot of the jazz stuff in there when he does that. And I think his solo is what, like seven minutes roughly? I have it on video. I had to videotape it. I'm like, this is insane, you know? Um, and I've seen some great drummers in my life, a lot of great drummers. But I was honestly most blown away by him. No offense to you, but it just was like, wow, this dude is a, an animal back there. Because he's not doing four on the four stuff, man. He's doing a ton of fills and a lot of cymbal work and ghost notes and accents and you're like this guy is insane but getting to you you were as great as i ever remembered you and i'm not gonna lie to you randy i i don't remember you specifically from 83 that was a lot of brain cells ago i'm pretty sure i've destroyed um and but what i do remember in the show from november was you know you've got a lot going on man you're you're not only vocally taking care of everything but you're doing a lot of fills you're not just playing chords up there. You're, you're doing a lot of intricate, you know, finger work with the way that you play. And, you know, you were doing a lot of tap dancing. I, I could tell you were trying to, you know, a lot of times I catch you looking down sort of to make sure you're hitting the right, the right, you know, the right pedal or what effects pedal or whatever. How taxing a show is it for you at this point? Or is it just kind of like, eh, I've done this a million times? I mean, we haven't been playing as much. Uh, you know, in the last, I'd say, 25 years, we haven't done half as many shows as we did last year. So as we, you know, got through the year, I started getting like a little more comfortable with what was going on. Um, I'm doing a lot of things on stage that I didn't do in the past. Like I'm, uh, you know, the the, uh, the delay effects on my voice, you know, yeah. I'm operating those from from the stage now. And and doing the timing on those. So that adds a little more to what I've been doing. And, um, you know, it just takes practice, you know, and of course, you know, the, the best practice is from in front of an audience. And so yeah. playing live, you know, as much as we have, has really made a big difference. And uh, I think as we go through this year, 2024, where we're going to be playing, you know, as at least as much as we did last year, uh, it's just going to get, it's going to just going to get better, you know? Well, how was the response to the tour overall in terms of 
you know, overall sales. Now, I mean, I was at the Keswick. It was probably about half full. You know, that's roughly. And that's, you know, but you guys, I hesitate to call you a legacy band because I don't really think you're a legacy band because you're not. Well, I guess you kind of are, though, because you haven't put an album out in 20 years. We're going to get to that. <laughs> but, but, but what I'm getting at is, you know, you know a band like if, I don't know, Pink Floyd were to play again or 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 yes or whatever. They're, you know, I'm trying to find a band that's not three different versions, but you know, Guns N' Roses, you know, they're kind of living off for the most part all the old tunes. What how how difficult has it been to sort of size up this this 23 tour now going forward into 24 as far as what size venues to play and like how to manipulate that properly so you're not you're not looking at a two-thirds empty place or you're not underselling yourself to the point where you can't get everybody in. That's a difficult, tricky sort of thing, right? Yeah. Well, you know, in our situation, uh, Zebra isn't like a household name. Right. And we have a lot of fans, but, you know, just we haven't been on the road in a long time. So uh, and a lot of the promoters and the people that are running the venues are younger. And right. Some of them never even heard of Zebra before. So it's, you know, our agent has to kind of a do a, you know, a lesson in, you know, education. History and, yeah. You know, and uh, we have to do a lot to try to just to just get in the door of a lot of these places anyway. But he's done a great job of doing that. And, uh, you know, I think the like the, the Keswick was probably an example of the, the, the worst proportion of people that that we've had. OK. Uh, We've really done well, you know, overall, as far as, uh, you know, getting the venues full. And, okay. Uh, you know, but uh, but the Keswick fans were just as, you know, rabid as uh, everybody oh, yeah. else was, you know. And, yeah. And, uh, and I think the important thing for, for the Zebra fans is, is that they're just, we, we got to get them back out, seeing the band again. And right. say, okay, well, they're, you know, they're still worth seeing and get the word out about that because, Word of mouth is really the best way to go about it. Well, you know how it is. Familiarity breeds, you know, whatever that saying is. It's like seeing the name out there and knowing that you're out there again is going to obviously pay dividends. Yeah. For sure. um, and what was cool about the Keswick show was, <clears throat> you know, when I first saw you, I was a very young man. I was a teenager, right? And, um, you know, and I, I can vividly remember Here's the disclaimer part. Uh, kids, if you're watching this, don't do what I was doing back then. Okay, I'm just saying it's not the way to go. But I remember we had a friend who was, you know, I was only 17. We had a friend who was legal. And we're like, hey, man, you know, can you get us some beers? And we jump in my Mustang and we head up to City Island and we sit in the parking lot. And, and that nostalgia is just so palpable. I remember that day so vividly. And it's just so... You know, it's so cool. Now, you had told me that that was like pretty much a one off show, right? Yeah. Like that was the only time that Quiet Riot joined in that thing. Right, right. That was the only show that we did with Quiet Riot on that particular tour. And um, uh, I think we did one more show with them down in uh, Houston. But I don't even I don't even remember whether it was with Loverboy or not. It might have been on another tour. OK, but that was a, that was a one off that you saw you know that's pretty cool man i'm lucky i i'm lucky i was there then i got to yeah. see something sort of semi-historical in the zebra canon right yeah. um so i guess uh we'll talk about what's coming up in 24 or more towards the end here but i kind of wanted to do some of those rote questions and i guess the first thing i wanted to hit on was you know you guys didn't just pop up in 1983 you'd been you'd been hitting it hard for many years down in the, in Louisiana, in the new Orleans Baton Rouge area. Right. And, um, at that point in time, I guess you joined Felix's band, right? Is that how it worked at Shepherd's Bush? Yeah. Well, right after I got out of high school, I met Felix, uh, at a bar I was working at. I was going to college at the time and there was a little bar called the library that was right off of the campus. And I started working there and uh, Felix and his roommate Eldridge had a band together and uh, Eldridge worked in the library. He was like the uh, the day manager. And I met him and he was telling me that they were putting a band together and they were looking for a guitar player. So uh, that was a, the time I met Felix. I went to his house and we talked and 
at at that time we were doing uh felix and eldridge had written a bunch of songs they wanted to call this band shepherd's bush and that was kind of the, the whole crux of the shepherd's bush band it was their material uh felix was the lead singer along with eldridge and we had uh, two other guys in the band and we played for you know rehearsed for about a year we only did a couple of shows out live and um and then the uh you know for one reason or another the band just kind of fell apart through mm -hmm. uh, uh, the rehearsals kind of got out of hand i think with the uh with the drugs and partying alcohol and yeah yeah and i think it was i think i was the one that said look i'm i'm kind of done with this you know nothing was moving forward right right um and so that was that was kind of it and i met guy shortly after that and he wanted to uh get together and play and uh we i knew a keyboard player that wanted to get in a band and do some more progressive music so the three of us got together and we started doing some stuff uh and we were actually just doing covers at that point uh, we hadn't done any covers in shepherd's bush uh, oh well, that was all original okay that was all original yeah and what was that like? Was that pretty much bluesy sort of stuff? More no, it, was, it no? was kind of sixties pop. More okay. 60s pop, yeah. Um, sort of like incense, peppermints type stuff like that. Yeah, like I, mean, stuff? I, I would say it's in that time period. It would have fit, you know. Okay. That, that era. Did you guys uh, do any actual recording, or was it just? Yeah, we did. We we did some recording at uh, Jazz City Studios, which uh, was a place that Felix had uh, worked at. Uh, and the guy that owned the studio, a guy named Cosmo Matassa, Cosmo. Uh, he's pretty legendary. And, yeah. Uh, he's actually in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame now. He got inducted like about eight years ago, I think. Oh, wow. But okay. Cosmo gave us uh, free studio time uh, because Felix was working there. And so we did some recordings there with him and uh, an engineer that he had, a guy named Skip Godwin. And uh, we're still looking to see if we can find copies of those tapes. I, I was just going to ask you: Does Felix have the tapes anywhere? No, he he hasn't come across them, and oh. but we do have a couple of other, uh, you know, leads to maybe find them. No you know, way! I've got a bunch of tapes laying around that I haven't listened to, but I've got I bought a couple of uh, old tape machines so I can review them and see. Real, what real to real, to it? Yeah. Or, or yeah, okay, real to real. real. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy, man! Now that would be pretty wicked to have that as some some bonus material on a box yeah. set down somewhere. Yeah, somewhere I think it would be awesome. You know, it was before the time of cassettes, so you know nobody had a cassette player back then. Yeah, so there weren't really many copies uh, going around. But no, no iPhones back then to record them. No, no, oh, what? The <laughs> no. <laughs> Just no. take what you could have done. Just uh, um, yeah. so you guys become Maelstrom. You add a fourth guy. You're actually a four piece at this point in time. Right. And and I believe, if I'm not correct, that did you, are you you haven't yet taken over lead vocals yet, right? I mean, Felix is still doing a lot. You're or you're all singing. We're all singing during the Maelstrom period. Yeah. Um, and you're still doing covers as Maelstrom, or that we're doing, well, Maelstrom was that was the, the the first time that we went out and actually did covers at all. Okay. And yeah, we're doing covers because we're playing at uh, dances and right uh, trying to get gigs and. You know, like I said, the keyboard player that we had, uh, Tim Thorson, he wanted to do more progressive music. Uh, you know, we were doing like Tull and uh, some Yes. And but when it came to doing these dances, you know, kids you couldn't play that dance. stuff. Yeah. And couldn't. so we were going to, you know, said we got to learn some dance stuff. Now, at that time, you know, we're talking, you know, like maybe David Bowie, you know, doing. Uh, you know some dance stuff you know right. from way back when you know gene genie or suffragette right. and stuff how about and some they, raspberries did you guys do some raspberries or uh, anything like that no, now nah. too no, poppy they had some great stuff but no we it was aerosmith okay uh, you know zz top you know yeah. stuff that you could dance to you know right um and we you know i think we did taking care of business you know a bunch of you know and Tim, the keyboard player, just didn't want to have anything to do with that. You know, okay, that was not it. why he got into it. So, at the end of '74, we kind of decided to reform. You know, Tim left, and uh, we 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 were thinking about getting a lead singer and just going out as three piece with a lead singer, but we we couldn't find anybody that uh, wanted to sing with us or 
or that we wanted to sing with us, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. So we went out as a three piece, you know, kind of unexpectedly, I, you know, we were still rehearsing. It was uh, just turned to 1975. We we're in January and uh, a friend of mine that I'd gone to high school with her, uh, her sorority was having a, a dance and the band that they had had canceled at the last minute, you know, and they, they had four days before uh, the dance was going to happen. And she was begging me, you know, if you can play it all, please, we can't get anybody at this point. And so I went back to the guys and we were pretty close to being ready. And we, you know, so that's what we did. We went and we played the dance and that was our first gig. And, uh, and, and this is in new or new Orleans, right? Yeah, this is in new Orleans. Okay. So you guys gig around there, you're doing covers and you start incorporating some originals in yeah. that. And we get to late set years. And, and when did you decide on the zebra name? What year? Right. Well, it was that at that point where we got that first gig. Okay. We didn't have a name. And so and, we, and what I, I heard it was a magazine cover that. Well, yeah, that, it was, it was a, it was a magazine cover that had been turned into a decoupage. Do you know what a decoupage? Yeah, is? yeah, that, uh, yeah, that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yep, you, yep. yeah. So it was sitting up on a wall in a frame in a bar where we were, where we had met to figure out a name. Right. And you know, we we sat there and talked for a couple of hours and a couple of pictures of beer and couldn't come up with a name. And at the very end, you know, I looked up and said, "Hey, maybe that's it, zebra." You know, and everybody just agreed, and that was it. We left. You know, we were on our way out, and it was called Zebra. All right, I want an exclusive here. Give me two of the other names you were considering. Oh. Can't remember. I mean, I could tell you that I, I probably put the names of bands that I uh, tried to come up with names with in, in elementary school, and I remember one of those was the Starlighters. Oh, the, yeah? The Rebels. Uh very 60s, very 60s. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there was a lot of that, you know. Mine was uh, in in middle school. Uh, you know, you you draw on your on your notebooks, right? Or on the you had that book covers back then. Remember, you'd get the book and you'd have to they'd yeah. show you how to fold the book cover, and you'd be like, "Man, I I gotta write something cool on here." So it'd be Kiss, and I'd put all the the various bands, Rush and stuff I was into. But my band was called Sorcerer's Song. Not. Sorcerer sauce. Sorcerer's song. Song. Sauce. Sorcerer. Sorcerer's song. Oh, sorcerer's song. Okay. S O N G. Yeah, because it was. I was probably reading. I'm pretty sure at that point in time I was reading Tolkien, and I was okay. probably getting into the whole, you know, the whole Hobbit yeah. shit and all that stuff. Yeah. But um, so you're gigging. You guys start to really build a rep around Louisiana or now were you primarily just playing New Orleans or did you get out into the state or out into other, you know, like oh, Mississippi no, we, or we, we definitely got out. Um, we had our, that guy Eldridge I was telling you about that was in the previous band. He was the manager now in the okay. very beginning of Zebra and he booked us some shows outside of New Orleans. Uh, some pretty funny shows too. Oh really? Yeah, there was a uh, there was one uh, show we did in a town that called French Settlement, French Settlement, Louisiana, and we drove past the place probably four times before we realized it was this tiny was little one, four yeah. buildings. Yeah, it was one building in the town, and that was it. There was really no sign. Wow, you know, saying what it was. Yeah. And so when we finally stopped, we, we just went in there to ask, do you know where this club is? And they said, well, this is it, you know? <laughs> yeah. You guys probably looked at each other like, oh, we shit. Said, well, why don't you have a sign out front? They said, well, everybody knows what this is. We don't Yeah, everybody, time, but, but yeah. It's the only <laughs> building in town, you know? So, it's the only place uh, to go, man. <laughs> yeah. So we played. There, I think four people showed up, two couples, uh. you know? And at the end of the night, the guy was didn't want to pay us. And... Uh, and the, our manager, Eldridge, looks at him. He goes, man, do you realize where this place is? He says, yeah, well, I know where we are. He says, you couldn't get the, anybody to come see the Beatles out here. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was just funny stuff, you know. We yeah, were, these are the days, fun. kids, of no GPS, no, yeah. you know. I mean, yeah. when you're driving around, you're mapping it. You're like, what the fuck? You know, yeah. it's like – 
Yeah, that's crazy. Did you get over to Houston by chance? Oh, yeah, yeah. We played in Houston. Okay. We came a little bit later. Because I grew up in, in Houston. Houston. Very early. Nobody knew who the hell we were. But well, I grew up in Houston from 76 20. to 80. I, Go ahead. Well, I was going to say I, I grew up in, in my what I would call my formative years when I discovered Kiss. Right before we moved, I discovered Kiss. Tall, Led Zeppelin, all those bands. I'm nine, eight, nine, ten. I had I had cool next door neighbors that would play pool, and these were older dudes, right, older boys, and they'd be like, "Yeah, we'll let the little punk hang around," and I'd just be like absorbing, you know, close to the edge and and uh, Aqua Lung and all these cool, you know, and Cheech and Chong, thank God, and George Carlin too, you know. So that was the kind of that was my education. But when I got down to Houston, then my first show was at the Summit. Which I'm going to ask you about the summit in a little bit. We'll get there in a sec, right. but um, because there's something I want to talk to you specifically about. Uh, but yeah, my first show was Kiss, and then and then Rush at the summit, and you played the summit, I believe, a couple of times actually. I'm sure, right? Yeah, and uh, but when we but like getting back to where you were talking about, we played Cardi's a lot in Houston. Or Cardi's, okay, okay, in Houston. Uh, pretty well-known club and you know we were going back and forth and, and so you know before 1980 uh we had been to houston several times well i want to highlight my friend here in the chat pat patrick he said i did lights for zebra at dallas city limits many many years ago there you go yeah. and ralph uh, I, I maybe knows you here hi randy he says oh yeah i know ralph um he Very said well. his, his band was implosion there you go cool um and what's cool, uh, Patrick says, Mitch, Mitch I'm not going to stop and do this the whole time, but since there's a couple guys, Mitch Win Wichner is one of my Win best friends. Mitch Wintner. Winster. Yeah. There you go. You know Mitch. Yeah, I know Mitch real well. He was in the business. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, Patrick did a lot of did lights and sound for many, many years. It's funny. I met him through having another Houston guy on. Um, Monty Colvin from the Galactic Cowboys was on a couple months back, and you know they were big along with King Zax, they're big Houston guys. So mm -hmm. um, let's move on here a little bit and get to how you get to New York. You guys decide you've kind of oversaturated that market down there. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of years building this rep. You just didn't just do it in one or two years. It was a long time kind of coming. And you have said in many interviews, your whole sort of goal was, and the band's goal was to get a recording contract. And so you figured la or new york now you had tie-ins with new york but i have a question for you before we go that route what if you had chose la we're talking 79 80 right uh you, 77 oh 77 oh well that's a little pre okay that's a little pre then my question doesn't fit as well i was going to say because if you're going in there around 80 that's the the birthing of hair metal and like i'm wondering how you would have navigated that situation because you guys were not a hair metal band never you were no, much more no. akin to a 70s zeppelin you know yeah we were just a hard rock band hard know? rock band yeah. yeah so all right throw that question out i i my timing was a little well, off we did much. go to la in 1980 you know oh, you we did lived out there yeah yeah but that was that was that before that was after you went to New York? Yes, that was after New York. Yeah. So what was – tell me a little bit about, about the backstory on that. What was going on there? We uh, we had just left our manager in New York, and uh, a guy uh, that, who was managing uh, – I'm going to – um, uh, my brain is like freezing right now. Um, Jim Recor was the guy's name, and Jim managed Christine McVie. Okay. At the time, sure. And he had heard about the band and was interested in managing the band. And so he he flew to New Orleans to uh, see us perform with Christine. Actually, you know, they both came to the show. Wow. And they, uh, you know, and he loved the band and uh, wanted us to come out to California and do some more demos. Now, now by this point, we had already done the demos for Who's Behind the Door and. Uh, a bunch of other stuff, you know, that, that WBAB, the radio station in New York, was playing. And we had already shopped yeah. those to record companies and been turned down at this point. Okay. Uh, so he wanted us to go out there and record some new stuff. And, and that's what we did. We went out to California for about, I, I'm, I'm going to say, more or less six months 
and did some recording. We didn't do any gigs or anything, uh, but we, you know, did the recording and hung out, you know, went down and saw what the scene was like there. And, uh, and this is 1980. Uh, this was not around 1980. Yeah. Do you remember what tracks you did? Were they anything that yeah, mounted? we did uh, hard living without you, which had been a new one. I think we did a demo of tell me what you want at that point. Okay. Which we didn't have before. Um, what else? I think that, Oh, she's waiting for you was another song that we had that we okay. did before. That's three of them. You know, I, I know that there were more, but right, right. And was he trying to shop those around in LA and all? Yeah, that yeah, or? yeah. He okay. wanted to shop them around, and uh, he did, but uh, nothing was happening with it. And all of a sudden, he disappeared, you know, off the face of the earth. Jeez. And um, and we were like, there, nobody knew anything. Christine didn't know anything. Wow. Uh, you know, nobody could tell us what had happened. So we were actually living in his his house, which was his which was his parents' house. They had passed away just a couple of years previously. And so we just kind of said, well, we got to, we got to get out of here. I mean, this was like, you know, a month where we he just where was he gone. Was. Yeah. He was just gone. Was um, it a drug related sort of thing? Or did you ever no, find it out? It turned out it was just uh, he had a breakdown, you know, Oh, okay. and uh, he was in the hospital and, you know, I guess nobody, he had a family and he had good friends too, but nobody was, you know, taking it up to tell everybody that he was dealing with what was happening and uh, or maybe he didn't want him to i don't know yeah but, uh, but we just packed up the house locked it up and went back to new york at that point you know now you went to new york because you had some friends in louisiana that knew people in new york or was that kind of the story uh yeah we originally went to new york because we knew somebody who did have family and friends in new york and that's that's what happened and you guys are young dudes here. You're in your very early 20s, right? Yeah, for the most part. 21 at that point. Wow. Yeah. And do you ever think to yourself, would I have done this if I was in my mid 30s? Like, do you ever look back and think? Because you know how it is. The the kind of innocence of youth. It's like, ah, fuck it. Let's just let's just go, man. Let's see what. I mean, that's got to be a lot of it, right? You know, I really think that the fact that uh, none of us were married at that point and no uh, kids. Yeah, it, it gives you a little more freedom. Sure. We weren't, nobody was tied down to some job, you know, that they couldn't okay. leave. Uh, and, you know, we wanted to give it a shot. I, I think that's the best time to do it, you know, when you're that young. And once you get into your 30s and your 40s, it's, it's a lot tougher to just do what we did. You know, it's, yeah. it's not, it, you, can, you can go out and play and you can form stuff and do things, but to just pick up and go live in an attic in New York. That's yeah. And that story is crazy. I, yeah. I heard you tell that story and I'm thinking, and you said there were six of you living in this. attic. Yes. Right? Uh -huh. Now who was, who would, was girlfriends when or what? No, 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 no. It was road crew. Oh, yeah. okay. So yeah. you had, you had a crew at this point. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We always had a crew from the very, very beginning. And, uh, because it was a lot of stuff to move for just three people. And, yeah. Uh, and, you know, we had guys that wanted to work and, and, you know, in the very beginning, we really weren't making any money at all. So all the money went to the crew, you know, said, okay, really humping around. And uh, that's the way we kind of did that. So we had a crew that went to New York with us. We had uh, uh, a sound man, lighting guy, and, uh, and a third guy who was just kind of fixing our truck for us as we went along, you know, the guy grew did you, up. Oh, did you guys buy your own truck to drive up and all that yeah, stuff? Yeah, we bought a used okay. truck to, you know, against my grandfather's, you know, advice. We bought mm -hmm. a truck for like 5,000 bucks and uh, it was going to be five of us going up there. It was uh, uh, our sound man, Don Helm, and lighting guy, Gary Gittleson. And so it was going to be five of us. And then as we were leaving New Orleans, the truck didn't even start. Oh shit! So I had a friend I grew up with, David Ferguson, who came uh, to our rescue. He says, "Yeah, you need another starter." He put the starter in. Truck started up, and I he owned a gas station at that point, you know. And I said, "I said, Ferg, how would you like to take a little vacation?" <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like know, a little vacation, yeah. be our mechanic <laughs> and our roadie, right? Yeah, he was the adventurous type, and he—that's uh, what he did. He. Uh, yeah. You know, he, he rode with us to New York. We I think we had two other times where we needed to get the thing repaired and he repaired it for us. So, you know, now the, had a big, big hand in getting us there in time. 
the crazy part about that story is that this person that you knew up there that was going to put you up and help yeah. get, get you gigs and everything called you a couple times, like right before you were ready to leave and was like, hey, I only got one gig for you. And you guys yeah. are like, oh, wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> I thought you had like all these things lined up for us. Now, nah, well, you know, so what was going on there? And like you just eventually said, F it, man, we're just going to go. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, you know, we had always, you know, it was a real kind of a small uh, community in New Orleans that we had developed that, you know, I mean, there were a lot of people coming to see us, but they were, it was like a tight community of people. And we advertise we're going to new york oh they're going yeah to new yeah york. it was like the big deal you know so yeah. we did uh we did a kind of a going away show zebra's going to new york and then you know he didn't call us until like i think it was the next day or something like that it was something really ridiculous because we were leaving in a couple of days and that was the first time he called and, yeah uh, we were like wow you know so well we'll just we'll wait you know we'll wait until uh because that was during the summer he said, give me a little more time. I think it'll be a lot better during the winter because there's so many bands up here that are already booked for the summer. Yeah. No excuse. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it came down to the winter and we're doing another one of those going going away, Zebra's going away shows. And, uh, <laughs> Part sure two. Enough, sure enough, he calls again. He says, yeah, I just haven't, you know, I got I got two gigs for you, you know, but they're both in my club and they're one night after the other. And oh. I almost have another one, but, you know, I really think maybe we should wait till spring. And so I don't know the guy that well, but I hung up with him and, uh, you know, got off the phone and I'm talking to Felix and Guy and I'm saying, you know, we've already done two of these going away shows. You know, Now what? We, yeah. can't, we can't do another. What are our choices here? Or, or, you know, we we tell people that, you know, again, we're going to wait and go a little later. That's no good. Yeah. Uh, we can lie and say we went to New York and pretend we came back. <laughs> And yeah, just hide, can, yeah. Hide somewhere till that happens, or we can just tell the guy we're coming. And you know, by that point, we were making really pretty good money in New Orleans, and we had saved up a lot of money. And so okay. we had enough money to survive to make the trip to go up, and at least you know survive for a couple of weeks and come back. And so we decided, yeah, let's just go, let's just do it, and that's what we did. We uh, and there's where being youthful. And kind of like throwing caution to the wind and saying, hey, man, what do we got to lose? Worst case scenario, it's a two-week vacation. Yeah. We, we go see New York City. We kind of get out there. We jam. We party. We do whatever. And then we come back, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know but you so ended up staying then. Called him, Yeah, we called him back up. And, uh, you know, and so he was like, you know, I guess he was kind of surprised. But, you know, he was willing to do it. And uh, so we went up. We played the first a gig which is was on a new year's eve uh there were two two gigs in a row and uh we played with a band one of the bigger bands in the area rat race choir uh they were kind of really progressive is that really good band. what was the guitar player for that band mark hit that dude that dude was insane back then Monster. man. Monster. yes is he still he died though didn't he yeah he did he died yeah. a couple years ago one of my best friends and just unbelievable Hold yeah on. like in my son's calling and it's I'll, I'll take it real quick okay that's fine jamie i'm in the interview call me back Bye -bye. all right okay cool cool so yeah marquette man what a monster guitar player people that don't know that guy need to go out and check out there yeah. is some, there's stuff out there on on youtube uh about him he was a monster player um you so you start to build a rep around the area. Um, and, but you're also shopping the demos, right? Or had well, that already happened? No, at this point, we don't even have any demos. We're just, we just got to New York. It's 1977. It's January. Okay. So we're back. We've gone back now a little bit. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I, this is where we were at when I was telling you the guy was going to, you know, we told him we're coming to New York no matter right, what. Right, 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 right. Okay. So that, I think that's where we were. But, Mm -hmm. uh, well, we jumped to 80 for LA. That's why. I was, oh, we, oh, that was, yeah, that was previous. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can go back there if you want. Well, what I'm curious about, though, is how, okay, so you're in New York. How does the machination start to put together professional demos? Because we're not talking four track demos here, right? I'm sure, right? 
No, no, we're, they were they were real demos, and um, you know we had we had jumped through a couple of managers in New York. Okay. Uh, in the first couple of years, and then uh, and then we uh, we ended up being managed by uh, a guy named Phil Basile, who owned a big club in uh, Island Park, New York, called Speaks, which we played often. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Phil got us uh, into a studio in. Um, where was it? Uh, it was in Queens uh, with a guy named Jeff Cracky who owned it. And we did the demos for Who's Behind the Door, Take Your Fingers From My Hair, Wait Until the Summer's Gone, a uh, bunch of the songs. So did he put the money up for this or did you guys all pitch in? And No, we we, we paid for the demos, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, but, and I, I think he maybe he had, maybe, maybe he put the money up front, you know, to get them done. Mm -hmm. But uh, he... But Phil was well off. I mean, he was like, you know, he's doing very well. And uh, but we did the we did the demos and um, and Phil shopped him and we couldn't get a deal. Wasn't happening. And um, just what, Atlantic or or a many to Atlantic. I mean, he had ha he had connections with Atlantic because he, okay. had, he had managed the Vanilla Fudge. Oh, OK. 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 Yeah. 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 And um, so he had good connections with Atlantic, but they weren't interested. They said that the music was dated. It sounded like, you know, if, it, if he'd have come to them 10 years earlier, they would have signed it. So, and he went to a couple of other labels too. I think RCA was one of them. And we got turned down left and right. But at the same time, we were just building up a huge following in the, in the Northeast. And that was WBAB, right? That was the, a huge catalyst for it. Well, yeah. When you, yeah, when we started packing the clubs and a lot of the clubs were advertising on BAB, uh, the program director, Bob Buckman had come out to a couple of our shows and he really liked the band and, uh, asked, asked us for if he could get hold of the demos we had made. And we, we gave him the demos and, you know, he played them on the, uh, their, their local show first, uh, that, uh, where they would play local bands. They had a show every, I think it was like on Tuesdays at five, 5 PM. Mm -hmm. They would feature local bands. So we got played on that, and all of a sudden people just started asking for it, and he put the songs into regular rotation at the station. And this is back in the day before pay-to-play, before giant conglomerates took over radio and destroyed it, quite frankly, where you know program directors could actually pick the songs. DJs could actually pick a song and go, hey – this is a this album's pretty ripping. I want to throw this on. Are you cool with that? Yeah. And that, you know, that is such a huge difference to well, now we don't really have radio anymore. Not really. I mean, not not like it was back then. And I hate to be the back in my day guy, but we can both be that guy because it was just a different, different landscape, right? Yeah. Well, I think that I think that radio was much more localized back then. Right. And even though you do see, you know, radio doing you know, local promotions and being involved in, in, in local affairs, it was much, much more involved way back in the day. And yeah. so DJs had a lot more discretion as to what they were going to play. And not only the deep, but the program director was really important because he was deciding what songs were actually going to get on there. And right. certainly if they had their pulse on the local scene, whether it was bands that were out there, like if Jethro Tull had a great song and, some of the fans were asking for that. They'd be out there. Why don't y'all play more of this? Why don't y'all play more of that? That stuff was, you know, able to be listened to. And, yeah. and you know, whereas today it, it does, you know, you talk to a guy at the station now, he says, there's nothing I can do. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. corporate, you know, they tell us what to play. It's pretty, exactly. yeah. you know, for the most part in radio, that's the way it is. So there are, and that really started about 20 years ago, that switch over when digital started to come in, to the four that's when the, the landscape started to really yeah. change because you like you said about the local scene like i was sitting here thinking before our interview i'm like how did i even find out about that zebra show like how would i have even known back then yeah. and the more i started thinking about it i'm like you know i had to have heard it on the radio that's the only way or somebody at school was like dude did you hear so-and-so's coming priest or maiden are coming you know that's how that's how we usually found things out. Now everything's immediate. It's just right here. Yeah. That's the good side of it. There's also a downside of it, which I have a question for you here in a minute about. But um, so you get you get turned down a bunch. Yeah. And, and 
And then what happens? Tell that story. It's just so good. I'm kind of resigned to the fact that we're not going to get a record deal. And uh, my wife and I bought a house down in Louisiana. And we're going to, I'm figuring I'll just settle there and we'll we'll just keep playing the the Louisiana circuit and and up in the Northeast. Can I interrupt for one second? I want to interrupt for one second. When you decide to go back and you buy a house in Louisiana, is it ever crossing your mind? Uh, okay, well, it's time to go get the nine to five thing, man. I got to go get a real job now. Is that ever hit no, you? No, no, no. That wasn't part of the the deal. We were okay. Making, we were making great, great money at that. Time. Okay, all right. Okay, okay. I mean, between you know the airplay we had gotten in New York and the fact that we were packing the clubs and doing the same thing down south, I wasn't. Even, that wasn't even on my mind. You know. Okay. We were, we were still on an upswing. You know. All right. At that point. Mm-hmm. We just, weren't getting the record deal and uh but bought the house in louisiana because you know i'm from there and my, and my mm-hmm. wife loved it felicia she she loved louisiana so that was easy and then uh sure enough like six months after we bought the house you know we're, we're up in new york and her sister actually got a, a call from somebody a friend of hers who knew somebody at atlantic that you know about how to get in touch with us, you know? Oh. And um, you know, we didn't have cell phones back then, you know, but we didn't right. have really a landline in New York either. Um, right, right. And so uh, said, yes, Atlantic Records is trying to get in touch with you. They, they left, the, left the note, you know. Uh, to make a long story short, though, it turned out that, that uh, a guy named Jason Flom from Atlantic, who, would, yep. you know, he was a kid too. I think he, I don't even think he was 20 years old at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it gone to WBAB in Long Island pitching uh, a record by some other group on Atlantic that Atlantic was trying to get played. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was talking to Bob Buckman about it. And, you know, at the, towards the end of the conversation, Bob mentioned Zebra and say, why don't you guys should really check these, this band out. Now, Jason had never heard of Zebra, didn't even know Atlantic had had turned us down. And and Atlantic had a new president at that, that point, a guy named Doug Morris had just become president of Atlantic. So it was kind of fresh years at Atlantic. And, uh, you know, after uh, Buck, Bob Buckman had told Jason the story of Zebra and how we were like the most requested band at the station, he took all that info back to Doug Morris. And, you know, long story short, that's how we got signed. You know, if it hadn't been but, for BAB, it probably didn't, never happened. But the crazy story is Doug gets that cassette from yeah. Jason. Puts it in the, the car he's driving in, whatever, yeah. it's a limo or whatever. Yeah, he's, he's listening to the, Who's Behind the Door, which has like literally almost a minute and a half intro on a, on a 12 string acoustic, right? Yeah. And he's like, ah, fuck this, man. This is, you know, hippie music here. And he takes it out and that song's playing. Like, what are the, there? you couldn't even do a mathematical calculation to figure out if that would ever happen again in the universe, right? Well, so he hears yeah. you guys playing and he's like, whoa. What happens then? You get that yeah. call right away? Yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, it's it's genius. I mean, you know, I I do know that you know Atlantic or all these record labels, they're they they want to hear the hook. You yeah, know, don't give us the fluff. You know, we don't need a big intro. Just what's the hook? Of course. And so, who's behind the door is like the worst example of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the it intro, is. you know, it and, is. But that was your first your first video, though, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. because the song, you know, so it's a popular. great song, and and. You just it's have to what, give it a chance. You know? Well, it's what grabbed me, man, because, you know, I'm thinking when I hear that song, right away my mind goes to Xanadu, of course, because the 12-string intro for that is kind of, you know, in, in a similar – it's got a similarness to it. Not the same, but, you know, it's got that vibe. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's that, that – Proggy, proggy rock thing. Rock. It's got a prog, progressive rock sort of vibe to it. and and But yet, I guess, w- was the number one single, though, Tell Me What You Want, or was it Who's Buying the Door? I like the radio the show was the first yeah that was the first MTV what? release and i think that was the one that uh that they pushed on radio first oh they did okay i wasn't I sure if it was that, that or I'm pretty sure it was because the first real records we sold outside of new york and new orleans where we sold that big bulk of new orleans to make it like the fastest selling debut was in st st louis actually yeah, you mentioned that, and you said that you got a call, and you're like, "Hey, you guys are selling records in St. Louis, and you're expecting to hear like, oh, they sold seven thousand albums this week, and they tell you they sold seven. Right? 
Well, and that was story. exciting. That was exciting yeah. to them. Yeah. But they were excited about that because yeah. it really meant that here was a market where we could know, expand. Was, and it was working. The radio, the radio play was translating into record sales. And that's what yeah. they look for. Because a lot of times that doesn't happen, you know. People yeah. might like a song, but they're not going to buy the record because of it, you know. So that happens. You do the now, had you gone out? Once the the album comes out, it comes out in March. I think March twenty first of of eighty three, and I didn't really connect to it until the, the the video. I saw the video, which I don't know when that was released. Do you remember? Was it summertime or late, like May? It was like we did it a couple of months after the record was released. That's what I thought. Yeah, and uh, so it was probably summerish. I couldn't tell you the exact the exact date, but it was yeah. right around the time we went on tour with uh, with Loverboy. Well, so I wanted to ask about that. How was that was your first major national tour then, right? Where you got yeah, to go. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, and how and any stories behind how that came about? Or was it just they pitched that to you and said, Hey, we got an opening slot, or was it Loverboy's manager calls and says, Hey, we want you guys to No, no, I you know, I think it was really a uh there was a guy in uh Louisiana who owned a uh uh, a, a promotion company. Uh, his name is Don Fox, and he he uh, he's it's Beaver Productions is the name of the company, and they've done concerts you know all over the South. You know, huge huge company. Right. And Don had a connection with um, with Loverboy because he had taken an interest in them when they first came out, and he had gotten them on. Uh, as an opening slot for Journey, when ah. Journey, you know, on a Journey tour, and that yeah. helped them get more exposure. And I think he just he really liked the band. He had had us play uh, at a place he had in Louisiana called the Warehouse, and we'd done that place a couple of times. And once we got the record deal, I think he had a I definitely had a hand in uh, in getting us on that Lover Boy tour. So okay. you know, little little politics involved there, but. But but in, at the end of the day, we didn't really know Don that well. You know, we knew him from playing those gigs, but right. you know, we were surprised. So it was a it was kind of a, a nice thing, and I I can't swear that's how it happened, but I think that had a lot to do with it. Now that tour, then you're playing pretty big venues now. Yeah, um, you're playing in in many places, arenas actually. Yeah, right? yeah. It was mainly arenas. The yeah. little boy was like. At their peak at that point, and they were uh, yeah you know, playing arenas. So yeah, we got we got a lot of good exposure, and that ties in with the summit because you there's a show out there called. I'm gonna pull it up here. I'm actually gonna show it if you don't mind. I'm not gonna play the video. I'm just gonna show the uh, the, the 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 thing on screen here a second because this, if I'm not incorrect. Is a DVD, right? Oh, it was a video. UHS beta right, yeah. originally, right? How did that happen? That you guys are this day? Did Atlantic put a bunch of money into this, or was no, somebody? Uh, how that happened? It was. It was actually just, uh, you know, the summit had cameras that they used for the shows. Okay. They folk and they, you know, projected up on the screen. And right. Were, you know, and it was a real time thing, so they hooked into the soundboard you know mm -hmm. our soundboard and they mm -hmm. just took the mix that our engineer was doing right and and gave us a video of the whole show of what they had projected on the screen wow and, and the music and there was no editing or anything this yeah was just, this was just completely live with you know edits in real time as the guys tell yeah as he's camera switching operators. cameras right you know, okay, we're going to go to this camera, that camera, whatever. But that was just, that's how that happened. It was just kind of a freak. Man, I'll tell you, this show is killer, man. You're playing, you are on fire on this video, man. Like, I'm just like, well, I can't play it because I'll probably get dinged, so I won't bother. But I would love to play a little bit. And anybody who's watching this now or later, you got to go check this video out. It's insane how, how just, on point you guys are how tight you guys are well um, i mean we were we were excited about the show because again it was houston it was a place that we had played 
enough to where we had a following there. Right. And, um, and we had also been on the road for a while now. We've been doing, you know, the same show. Right. You know, because we had like 45 minutes to play and we've been doing the same group of songs, which we never did before. You know, when right, we did, right. from 1975 up until then, we just called out songs on stage. There was yeah, no wow. All the different no covers. Yeah. But now we had been doing this set list and just practicing. So, you know, we were we were pretty tight at that point. Well, do you. I mean, was the grouping with Loverboy good? You got along with those guys? Oh, yeah, good? yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. they're Canadians. How you? How's anything going to go wrong with Canadians? Come on. <laughs> yeah. right? They were just, they were really good guys. A lot of fun to be with. And I, I've done several shows with them since then, too, you know. Well, and, speaking uh, of Canadians, you know, I have to bring it up. It's been brought up before, but I don't know that you've been actually asked this directly. You know, as a three-piece, you're going to get compared to two of the most famous three-pieces, Rush, Triumph obviously mm -hmm. and i mean really you and triumph have a little more and slightly more in common than i think than you and rush in that your music is a little bit more pop tinged maybe it's like kind of, we're, we're 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 a little more similar like you guys have a little more here. did you guys ever tour with them or ever was that ever proposed or no uh i mean certainly with either with either it in the past but but we have done shows with Rick Emmett. You know, we had okay. you know, yeah. Rick Emmett uh, as a solo artist open for us here in New York. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah, you know, several years ago. And uh, and I've also done some uh, uh, solo shows with him, you know. Uh, great great private guy. Par private parties, too. So yeah. I've gotten to meet Rick several times. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a sweetheart. Yeah, such a sweet guy, man. Such a great guy. Guys in Russia are pretty all right too. I've met him once. It was a uh -huh. huge, almost as almost as huge as meeting Randy Jackson. It was almost that cool. <laughs> but um, I just wonder because you know that would have been a great. I would have thought back then would have been a very cool pairing to have. You got and Rush was pretty adventurous in who they would have open. I mean they'd have Primus and Tommy Shaw and Vinny Moore and Boy Bod and I mean they'd always kind of be like let's give some weird band a shot here you know what i mean well not, kiss, not, not you guys were weird you get what i'm did, saying though didn't they open for kiss at one oh point? yeah they opened for kiss a lot yeah. man like that was their big break and yeah so that's that's probably if, if kiss can do that for them they can do this for anybody right yeah yep yep absolutely um moving on real quick so that album does amazingly well you get a lot of traction with it and then the the sophomore album comes up and we got No Telling Lies, uh, which comes out in 85? 84. 80, 84, right. Um, and it doesn't do as well. Um, what what do you attribute that to? Like, was it the, the sophomore jinx? Was it you didn't have enough time to really sit and prepare or prepare for it? Or And were some of those tracks, any of those tracks left over? I know Wait Until the Summer Is Gone was one that was pre-existing. But what about the other stuff? And and how do you feel about that album now, you know, almost 40 years later? Um, it was, you know, what it was, was that the first album had been, con we had eight years to figure out, to sort through songs for that first album. Uh, Waiting to the Summer's Gone was a song that people liked, but it just didn't make it to the, to the first album. Bears was another one. Right. That was another one that we had. We could have put on the first album, but we didn't. Uh, all the rest of the songs were done, you know, right then. And I, I think, you know, in hindsight, I wish I would have been writing on the road. Like when we were out with Loverboy and we were out with Cheap Trick, I should have been writing more while we were on the road. But, you know, I had a ton of stuff that had been written anyway, but I had to just piece it together. But it wasn't as coherent as a, as an album you know yeah uh, the, the the songs there was such a variety of different genres you know in the in that second album there's yeah you know there's a, like a there's swing songs there's you know ballad there's you know heavy heavy you know waiting to the summer's gone i don't think there was anything like that on the first album or, so. or you have a track like but no more yeah which is really heavy i mean um yeah, it's. I'm looking at it here. I'm looking at the, the track listing. I, I won't lie to you. It's my least favorite of the three of the four, um, because it, it does seem like it, it doesn't have maybe the immediacy of the first album in a weird way. I love the cover though, and that's one of your 
your famous covers. We won't get into the Cobra Kai thing because you've talked about it a million times, but that's kind of a cool little angle. Well, I, Angie Alcius tour, who was a uh, guy's wife at the time, she drew the cover. Oh, nice. And she also was a co-writer on But No More. Oh, really? Yeah. That's my favorite song on the album. Yeah. Oh, I see. And, okay. That was Guy's wife or is his yeah, wife? Yeah, his wife at the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, how – what? Um, Captain Obvious here, question. Was it pretty disappointing that it kind of didn't really get a lot of traction with out Yeah, out of I mean, it came out, I mean, right out of the gate, we had problems. And and one of the problems was when we sent, we sent Waiting to the Summer's Gone to the radio stations and we got multiple complaints that the vocal wasn't loud enough in the mix. And really? so we went back in the studio, not to remix, but just to add a vocal on top of the mix that we had. So double tracking, yeah, just tracking, a, yeah, yeah, a unison vocal, yeah, yeah, and, and that's what we did, uh, you know. And I went back and sang it. That was easier than doing the whole mix all over again. But that was yeah. the same. That was the same producer, Jack, right? Yeah, I mean, it was Jack Douglas. Yep. Yeah. And, and same studio, or no? That was a different studio, right? No, we we actually did. Uh, we had recorded the the the, the thing in uh, Atlantic Studios, but. The mix for the first record was in Atlantic Studios, and we had mixed the second record in Atlantic Studios. So they Weird. were both mixed in the same place. And um, and so when we sent the second version out, it's really kind of too late at that point. You know, it's yeah. like the the excitement's gone. You know, yeah. Here we go yeah. the second version of this one, what's going to happen to the rest of it? So the buzz was lost, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know that, that that would have made all the difference in the world with the record, you know. It, it might not have done as well anyway, but, you know. Well, I do. Re I have a fond memory of that album, too, because I lived with two dudes. We were all working jobs. I think I was in college. And I remember we had a pretty – we had a nice apartment, but we pretty much trashed that apartment. And we used to sit and take Molson bottles and throw them at the wall to see if we could stick them nose first into the into the wall <laughs> cost, cost us that a lot of money when we we left that place i remember yeah, that sure. but we'd sit there drinking and we cranked that album man we used to love that album so i still do love it don't get me wrong yeah but it, it's probably my least favorite now getting to the third album 3.5 which is 86 now right right um i know you have a fond spot for this album and so do i i i really think this album while it is considerably more radio friendly or popular per se, there are so many killer tracks on it, so many earworms, so many hooky songs, right? And talk a little, real briefly about that, about how was putting that together, and and then ultimately you get dropped after that album. And yeah. I mean, had that had that album been handled better, maybe it was timing. I don't know because we're still not in grunge yet. We're not into the '90s yet. But but I, I I gotta think that it just wasn't handled very well with the promotion team. But talk briefly about that one. Yeah, I mean, I you know I went on the road with the uh, while we were touring for the second album, and I wrote you know I did what I wish I would have done for the second record, and uh, and I came up with a group of songs. You know, I think it was about 30, 30 really good songs. We picked. 10 and they work together they it sounds like a yes. album. it sounds like they you know very cohesive body of work that yep. should be together and uh, so i was really proud of it uh the record came out right around the same time that slippery when wet came out oh and, and so we got i think we kind of got lost in the sauce with that that yeah uh, bon jovi had such a great video oh you know uh, opening that record and so we'd be touring the country with uh uh and going to radio stations and doing interviews and uh inevitably inevitably the uh the conversation would go to bon jovi you know so i think that had something to do with it yeah uh whether atlantic promoted it enough or not i, I couldn't really tell you uh did you how much touring did you do on no telling lies and 3.5 was there a, a lot or yeah, did it diminish on, on no telling lies uh when when 3.5 came out we decided we didn't want to go out and open again. We wanted to try to go out and just do headlining, even if it was in smaller uh, venues. And yeah. that could have been a, a mistake too. Um, 
but we, we had so much material. We didn't want to do like 40 minutes worth of sure. stuff, you know, and yeah. I really wanted to uh, showcase the 3.5, you know, so this gave us a better chance to do that. But, you know, hindsight's 2020. And, yeah. The, uh, and so that, um, I mean, again, so many great songs on it. Like, um, man, he's making you the full time. Your mind's open. Every song on this album is killer. I, I'm just being honest. I sometimes struggle with whether I like this more than the debut. And and everybody talks about the debut. And nobody talks about this enough, in my opinion. Except me. If you go watch my video, we did a video two years ago, me and my friend Dennis. And I'm raving about this album. I'm like, you got it. We're probably drunk a little bit. But I'm like, dude, you got to check this out, man. It's killer. Um yeah. Oh my God. About to make the time. Probably my favorite zebra song. Thanks. Just yeah, love nice. that track. So do you have uh 20 minutes yet? And I'll get you out of here. I'm really proud of it. I, I kept, I'm looking, keep going. I just got to. Okay. Uh... Yeah. I know you got your, your son's looking to get a hold of you. If you need to call him, yeah. give him a quick call. All right. So, um, but yeah, that album is, is really amazing. And then you get dropped. Yeah. And, do you even get a call? Does anybody even say, hey, Randy, sorry, man. It's just the way it is. It's the business. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I was good friends with Jason, you know, he, and uh, we had a, a personal relationship. I think he had called and let us know. But I think we got the the initial word from our manager, Mark Fuma. He told us first. But, um, you know, there was uh, it, it was it, it was surprising. I was going to say, did you feel it coming? Clearly you didn't. I didn't feel it coming. It was frustrating for me because I felt like I had just done my best work. Yeah. And now I'm getting dropped. But at the end of the day, it's a business. And if they didn't sell enough records, it doesn't matter how good the stuff was. Yeah. You know? And you had two more, uh, two more albums that you could have. Well, there were two more albums that we were obliged to, to do for them, you know? Right. But they weren't obliged to cover you. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's how that works. Now, you said your parents were attorneys. Yes. Did did you have them involved in looking over any of your contractual stuff or who was No, no, no they you were, kept that no, they, clean? Were, they were they were not music attorneys. My, my okay. father recommended the guy who did the original Okay. Uh, contract with Atlantic and uh, one of the guys that uh, one of my best friends who I went to school with, Steve Schwess, he became our just attorney from, okay. from that point on. And, you know, he, he wasn't a music attorney per se, but he, uh, but he learned it, you know? And so okay. he, we, between, uh, myself and, uh, and his, you know, his knowledge, I, you know, we, we put together my publishing company and, and we did everything contractually that Zebra had to do after that. Yeah. And I remember one of the interviews, I think I only heard you ever mention this once, but when you originally signed with Atlantic, they wanted to take publishing from, from you and you were wisely said nope yeah that was going to be a deal breaker for me that's where the money that's where a lot of the big money's at yeah a lot of the money's there and uh you know that they you know what i did was i told them basically that uh you know if i got an offer for the publishing that uh you know that i was considering that i'd give them the right to to match it or beat it. I wouldn't just take the offer, you know, okay, that's not yeah. how we work that whole thing out, but I wasn't going to sign with their publishing company, you know? Yeah. Do you still own, do you own your own publishing? Yeah. Okay. Still own it all. Very, very cool. Very, very cool. That's the key. A um, couple quickie things. So the band kind of doesn't really, Oh, I had two quick ones. The La La song on the yeah. original album. How how much tracking did you have to do to get that right, or was it all pretty much first takes, or was there a lot of to get the la 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 la? la? Was it oh, pretty? No, I, no, I don't. We had been playing that song for eight years at that point. I don't. Okay. It didn't really take that long. No, not no longer than anything else, you know. And you're all three singing on that. That's not just you, right? Um, I'm pretty sure we all sang on that one. Yeah. Um, last thing on that one was there's a weird voice thing at the very end of Who's Behind the Door. Uh huh. Like you can hear like almost like dialogue going on or something. Yeah. What what is that? Well, it was like a failed attempt at trying to find a uh some sound effects for that part of the song. Uh we were looking for, you know, there was gonna be this huge huge explosion. So mm -hmm. uh, we were trying to set the scene with maybe uh 
uh, you know, animals, animal sounds, children laughing like in a schoolyard or something like that. The uh, and um, and the sound effect records that we had available to us at the record plant were just they were terrible. <laughs> uh, you know, they they were they were you know crackling in them. They weren't clean. Okay, uh, and it was but each record had the sounds on one side. And then when you flipped it over, it was the sounds were same sounds were on the flip side, except there was a narrator oh. during, the, during the sounds. Okay. And the narrator just always had us cracking up. I mean, he just sounded so stiff and just, you know, yeah. and so what he says is he says, this is the sound of thousands of snapping shrimp. No way, really. It had nothing to do with the song. We just figured if we had, we had spent two hours listening to these records and it cost us like five hundred bucks, we're gonna get something out of it, you know. So that's, that's awesome. Out of it, you know. So it was kind of like a like a public broadcast type, like educational record. Yeah, right? yeah, that's kind of like what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy, man. I always wondered about that because I'm like, what the hell is that? I thought it was you doing sort of a you know, like a rush thing, like this is the, the what a uh, all, attention all plants of the Solar Federation just. No, now was, that explosion was that a fair light? What what did you? No, use? no, that was done with a uh, uh, a maxi core, which was one of the first uh, du duophonic uh, synthesizers. It's a uh, it had two. You could play two voices with it. Okay. You know? It, we got that back in 1975. You know, they didn't have polyphonic synthesizers back then. Right, mono. So all right. they had was monophonic, and this yeah. was the first one to actually have two. Ah. And so one of the sounds that I had programmed into that was this explosion. And so that came right off of that. How about that? Okay, so yeah, because we're probably not quite quite yet at digital sampling at that point right or are we no we're, we're not getting close like 1984 yeah. we used a lot of uh the emulator okay you know, in in on the uh no telling lies but we were still using uh mellotron for the first album and you know whatever you know like the real the real mellotron a real mellotron yeah okay wow cool cool uh i oft, i often ask my guests this and i anticipate maybe the answer will be no here, but I just real quick. And then I've got like four or five more quickies. Um, do you or have you ever experienced performance anxiety, like like stage fright or anything like that? Did you have it like early on and lose it as you went along? Or do you, I, cause I know a lot of musicians and many of them tell me they still have that sort of that feeling in their stomach a little bit where it's like, I, I they're tight. You know what I mean? I just wonder because you know, I play and all, but I have had a lot of anxiety issues through my life, and it's always affected me pretty badly. Like I'm like, man, I, I just can't. I do this, but it's like getting in front of a crowd scares the living shit out of me. You know that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, I, you know, in general, no, I, okay. I, I don't really have a big problem. Um, but I have had, you know, times when I was nervous, and uh, and usually I can associate those times with me being tired. I didn't get yeah. enough sleep. And so that's making me nervous, you know, cause I can tell I'm not, you know, I'm not You're struggling a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so I just be a little bit nervous about that. Um, I've also suffered uh, from depression my whole life. And okay. I've, got, I've had some points where, you know, it was just the wrong time to be doing a show. And so I'd be, I wouldn't call it stage flight, right. But just, you know, a little anxious. Yeah. Shouldn't, shouldn't be going on stage but yeah. doing it and getting through it you know yeah yeah that's okay. tough that's tough i get that i've, I've had i've had my struggles with the more the anxiety than the depression but the, the strange thing is that anxiety often begets depression so it's this vicious sort of you know circle where the depression affects the anxiety the anxiety affects you physically to where you don't feel well or you, you don't want to get out of bed or you don't want to function and that's a that's a nasty nasty circle to be in. So, but I've heard you say that you're doing really well now. So that's great. Um, yeah, yeah, I've I've got the right combo of meds, so it's it's been working good. Um, you know, I'm sure you've heard Dream Theater's cover of of Take Your Fingers, right? Yeah, yeah. What do you think of it? I thought it was great. It was yeah. very flattering that they did it, and uh, they did. You know awesome. the guys? Do you, they went out with you, right? 
We we did. I think we did one show with them when they were called Majesty. Right, uh, way back. They called themselves Dream Theater. Uh, yeah. uh, we played with them here on Long Island, and um, but they were fans of the band, you know, because yeah. they, oh yeah, you know, grown up, you know, watching the club scene when we first got up here, along with all the other bands on Long Island. So they were fans of the music. Are, are there any other covers you know out there of? that have been done of your material that are of like, of not, not of anything. Notes, know, nobody of notes. Yeah. Like we, I've, I've had, there've been a lot of bands that have played zebra songs, you know, and they, they'll send sure. me videos of them doing it live and, and stuff like that. But it's kind of flattering. Even if they do it shitty, it's still kind of flattering. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it, it's all flattering, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the band ends, but it doesn't really end. It, it just kind of goes into sort of a semi dormancy where you're playing some shows here and there. But Atlantic comes calling to you, and they want you to do a solo album, right? Yeah, they wanted me to do a solo record, and uh, and I said, why don't we just do another Zebra record? And no, Andrew, do that. This was Doug Morris that was asking. He asked Jason, "What's Randy Jackson doing?" So, mm. you know, so we did a, uh, you know, I signed the deal with them to do a solo record. Yeah, you did this record. album. Yeah, you, you did this album right here called China Rain, Randy Jackson's China Rain. Right. And I'm trying to think, Randy, was that actually initially released with Atlantic or no? No, it was never released with Atlantic. That's what I thought. Yeah. It came they, out uh, later, much later, right? It got released, yeah. They they gave me the masters to, to, uh, to release on my own. Right. And, um, you know, while we were making the China Rain record, was at the time Nirvana had just come out. Yeah. So everything about eighties rocks was crashing. Right. And that was, that's what happened pretty, pretty much, you know, as good as the record was, it was eighties. You just Constantly. got caught in the blender. Yeah. yeah. And it was The weird thing is though, when was it made? Was it 89 that you yeah, so recorded I, it? We started the recording in 89 and okay. finished it came out. It was supposed to come out in 91. Yeah. And, and, uh, it was too late, you know, and Atlantic had been having a rough time anyway, uh, because they were like one of the last major labels to get on the grunge band bandwagon. Right. And I remember that when, when I was told they weren't going to release the record, I was kind of like couched for a while, you know, two weeks, like trying to figure yeah. out what had happened. Cause I hadn't really been paying a lot of attention to, to what was going on in the music world. And, uh, but I remember watching late night TV, and seeing that they were selling a Led Zeppelin box set, right? Yeah, I remember the four CD box four set, CD box set, the big one of the first big box sets to come out. Yeah, and I Led guess. Zeppelin had sworn, don't be a big Zeppelin fan. I knew that they were not going to ever have a greatest hits record out. It wasn't going to happen. And so I'm saying to myself, man, they must have made them a deal they couldn't refuse. Oh, it had to have been massive, man. Yeah. And yeah. And I and I was told, you know, that Atlantic had been in the red for two quarters in a row, which had never happened right. in the whole history of the company. And so they were desperate to like do a lot of shifting and they just and that box set brought them back into the black and yeah, just know, helped float them along. The Zeppelin thing yeah. until they until they were able to sign like Stone Temple Pilots and get get some uh, you know traction current kind of stuff going yeah yeah and the weird thing about that box set is it's not it, it's pretty much all of their most all their tracks because then they put out the rest of the tracks on a two CD box set that came out later but it's like all jumbled and out of order and it's very bizarre from that perspective you know. Well, it was like they didn't, you know, they didn't want to do a greatest hits, which would have been just taking the top radio hits and putting them on right. TV. So I think they they kind of stuck to their guns by putting, you know, a combination of uh, hit tracks and deep tracks on yeah. on all four of the CDs so that it didn't have to be a quote unquote greatest hits. Greatest thing, hits, you know? yeah. And the weird thing for me is that's the only, I own how, I own physical. But that's the only Zeppelin I actually own because it's got it all. Right. Except for the box sets that then started to come out with the page curated. But um, so, yeah, the China Rain thing, I 
I had not listened to it in forever. I remember listening to it a bunch of years ago. It was impossible to find. It's still pretty impossible to find. Like you're going to pay good money to get an OG copy of it on even on CD. Was that Mayhem it came out on or no, uh it came out on some of the Beyond B records, which what was, was it? Beyond. Beyond, yeah, B. That's I couldn't remember. That was, uh, you know, they're they're up upstate New York, and then it also came out on an Italian label. Okay. Um, you know what? A memory's failing me right that's now. That's fine. That's fine. And and I'm trying to hurry here to get you out of here in ten minutes. Um, the it, it does sound very '80s to me. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of the keyboard sounds. A lot of the synth sounds are very very kind of of the time you know what i mean there's some it good is, songs yeah. in there explain to me that the video though there was one video you made for for the lead off track um i i had i didn't write you're, the name only, you're only lonely today yeah that's a pretty dark video man yeah well uh you know it was done by a friend of mine was uh doing film at the time a guy named uh, larry robbins and uh it was way after Atlantic had decided not to release it. And the, the, uh, the record labels had asked if we could do a video and he did this video like for nothing. Basically. Yeah. I think the whole cost, everything was like $5,000 or something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, which is nothing it, when they uh, were doing, it was really just a big favor. And, uh, yeah, you know, we had a good time doing it, but yeah, it was kind of dark. Uh, you know, the, the, the concept, you know, as you can see in the video, it's it's trying to tell a, a, a story about reality, you know? Yeah. A lot of different perspectives and try to be a little funny at times, too. And you you're know? playing a lot of slide on that song, too, which yeah. is not your normal your normal thing. Um, and I have to say, man, the hair looking immaculate in that video. man. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, I had good hair, right? <laughs> you had great hair back then, for sure. No doubt. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that one is a tough one to come by. And then after that, you did the sign, which I have somewhere. I don't. It's buried in my collection. I unfortunately I had to move because of COVID, and nothing's up on the wall alphabetical. And they were all alphabetical in boxes. And slowly over time, everything got moved and shifted. And cr hell, I have no idea where it's at. But I do have that. And that was with Billy Greer of Kansas. And who else was on that? Mark you know, Mangold. Matt, Mark Mangold. Yeah. Terry who Brock. Was? Terry who? Brock sang. Oh, was Terry Brock? Was Bobby Rondinelli on that? Yeah, Bobby Rondinelli playing drums. Yeah. How'd that all come together? Like, was that Billy put that together? Did you or Frontier? No, uh, you know, uh, Terry w originally, uh, Mark Mark called me, mm -hmm. uh, and our first thought of singer, we wanted to get Brad Delp. Mm. He hadn't done anything in a while, you know. Yeah. Uh, we knew he was doing his Beatle cover thing, you know, but we couldn't get in touch with him for anything. I mean, wow. he was just like, there were like blocks everywhere to, to get in touch. And it was weird because it seemed like it was, we probably could have just gone up and gone to one of his gigs and talked to him. But, uh, you know, as it turned out, we just, you know, caught, we knew Terry was around and Terry's a great singer. And we got Terry involved and, uh, and Terry knew Billy because Terry had played with uh, Kansas right and um and then i knew bobby bobby ronanelli lives you know right around here so that was where uh you know the rest of the band got formed you know that's well, that's a couple years before brad took his life but i mean yeah. you know i think he was struggling for a long time before that that's clear there was was some some rough stuff going on there it's really a shame because that guy was just so otherworldly back in in the i mean that voice still to this day yeah. when you think of iconic voices you know it's him it's jeff buckley it's chris cornell it's randy jackson i'm kissing your ass uh <laughs> no, he's he was definitely on the top of our list and uh you know did you know him voices ever never met him never met him okay yeah um all right so you also did a Jefferson Airplane thing, which I had no idea until I read your Wikipedia page. I'm like, what? Like, where did that happen? How, how'd that all come about? Well, it was during the time of the China Rain record while we were making it. And uh, the, my manager, Scott Ross, at the time, uh, his one of his best friends was Kenny Arnoff. And so Kenny and I had had dinner. We got to know each other a little bit, you know. And uh, Kenny was going out to... Uh, tour with the the Jefferson Airplane. The Jefferson Airplane was getting back together after 
whatever it was, 12 years. Uh, you know, this was the original band. That was yeah, because it had been the Starship with Grace Slick and uh, Mickey Thomas that had the, yeah. the big Jane hit and all that stuff. But then yeah, they, yeah. Wanted to, they wanted to put the more rock band, the harder rock band back. Yeah, back. they put, you know, so Yorma and Jack, you know, Jack Cassidy were back in the band. And uh, they had the original band except for one piece, and that was the drummer. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Kenny was playing drums. Um, they had a keyboard player, um, Tim Gordon, Gordon, and he was playing keyboards, but they wanted one other person to fill in because they were doing, a, they did a new record in 1989 and it yeah. was a little more complex than the older Jefferson Airplane right. stuff. And plus they, they just felt like they, you know, it would be better to have somebody. So I went and uh, played keyboards and guitar and did some background vocals during the, uh, during the tour. And, was it just that just that one tour? Like how many yeah. was it a lot of dates? I don't remember yeah, this. Yeah, it was you know, we, we we played we were on the road for months and uh it was it was a lot of fun. I got to meet uh Bill Graham. I would have never oh, met him. Oh wow. Yeah, I mean really got to meet him backstage at the uh at the Film War West. You know, we did seven shows out there and um you know, and I got to meet a lot of <laughs> a lot of people you would just not even think of uh, i remember june lockhart you know was was backstage at, uh, uh -huh. yeah really well, yeah she was a big jefferson airplane fan you know and wow just people you wouldn't even think about uh so it was it was it was fun did slick show up at any shows like did she come to San Francisco? She, was, she was in the band oh she was in the band yeah the, no oh, when i God. say she this was the original jefferson oh airplane. okay i'm sorry i misconstrued that i thought that I thought, why? Well, well Cantner was in that version of yeah. Starship that got popular. Yeah, and then Cant so it was Cantner, Grace Slick, uh -huh. Yorma, Jack, Jack Cassidy, and Marty Ballin. Oh, and Marty Ballin came back. Yeah. Well, it's like, wow. that was the Jefferson Airplane. Yeah, you know? yeah. Wow. It wasn't any other Jefferson Airplane, you know? Okay, After I got you. Jefferson airplane, then they did all the Starship stuff with various members, you know, contributing to whatever else they were doing, but this was the airplane. That had to be a pretty cool pinch me sort of moment just to be like out there yeah. doing that because it's not really your audience per se, right. but you're part of that whole entourage, which had to be kind of trippy. I mean, had they, had, were they still stuck in the sixties a bit? Because I, I heard you tell a story about, about Paul smoking a joint on the stage or side stage or something yeah. and cops asking, which is funny now, given where we're at with, Weed is legal pretty much everywhere now for the most part. Cops aren't going to bug you smoking a joint now, but that's 89, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, are you – I heard had heard you say you stopped drinking and and drugging a yeah, quite a long yeah, while yeah. back. Are yeah, you clean at this point in time? 1986, I had completely stopped. So, oh, I, yeah, I wasn't drinking or doing drugs. And and uh, Grace was completely clean too. You know, oh. I know she, had, she had a pretty good – history of uh craziness yeah. and uh but she was you know the only person that was doing anything was uh you know paul oh. and he you know he always i guess was able to maintain you know he never had yeah. a, a real quote-unquote problem you know yeah but, uh, but he was he, he had a wicked sense of humor and hey. you know, he could be a little nasty at times and that was what happened with the with, with the cops at that show but um, and i guess when did marty die marty died yeah, he died several years ago you know 2000 exactly. or 2010 or something was he in good form was his voice in good shape oh yeah they, they were all really in good shape and uh there were not not any issues i mean i think everybody for the most part, had a great time doing the tour and getting back together, you know. I mean, you could tell during the rehearsals when we started, you know, that, you know, that the, the past was coming right back, the, the, the old memories were coming back. But, uh, but they all, you know, had respect for each other and, and did, uh, you know, what they needed to do, get, get this thing on the road. And, you know, I had, I had a great time and they were great people. They, you know, it was a uh, lot of Treated you well? treated treated everybody great and uh and they were having a good time okay last two um number first of all i want to thank you for so much time i didn't warn you i tend to go pretty long you know you maybe you looked at some of my videos and noticed they're pretty long interviews i don't i don't i don't f around man i try to get deep deep down i hope i didn't overkill too much of the stuff you've already gone through but i, I think i got some nuggets out today which is fun good. um the the one thing i I lied. Three. 
The one quick thing I did want to ask you about, and, I, and maybe I'm misconstruing, and you are talking about the China Rain album, but there's no actual Randy Jackson solo album that's buried somewhere, right? No, halfway through the China Rain, Atlantic decided they wanted it to be called a band. Can you do? Can you put a band together and we'll call it a band instead okay. of calling it Randy Jackson? Okay. And um, so, you know, that's what we did. And you're talking about looking for names. Well, the best place to find a wacky name is to go to the racetrack forums because that's what we did, you know. Oh, Just really? Like horse, you know. Oh, horse names. Name, horse names because those are some of the craziest names. Yeah. A lot of them make good names for bands. So, so China Rain was a was a horse running in. No, it wasn't a horse, but but what we that was where I was looking. There was a uh, there okay. was a name that I really thought was cool called Tragic Dancer. Oh, you know? yeah. yeah, and uh, and it could have been that there were there was several names that we got from the horse thing, but actually the China Rain was a, a like a fragrance of a perfume that my wife's friend had. And I okay. kind of just like the way the name sounded, and that's how that ended up being. Well, look, let's let's talk about 2024. Uh, it, you're going to carry over this pretty successful to this point, uh, 23 revisitation of, of the debut album. Um, are you going to, now that's 2024, are you going to do the full set of the debut album and a full No Tell and Lies? You're not going to do that, I don't think, right? <laughs> No, there's no plans to do that. But we're we're going to be we've we've got a, a whole other show we're putting together for 2023 for the areas that we've already been to and done the first album in. Um, and but the new cities that we hit, you know, we're going to be doing the the entire first album again. Like yeah, and know. and I should note that all of your links, your social links, are in the description down below. The door dot com, uh, your Facebook page, your Twitter page. Uh, there are new dates, I think, that were just announced in the last few days, last week. Yeah. Or so. yeah. um, you're not coming near Philly or Baltimore, damn it. But, you know. Not right now, but there's a lot more dates being booked as we speak. I just got, you know, uh, a couple sent to me today. And um, Cool. So, yeah, I'm definitely going to be at a Philly or Baltimore show uh, should, uh, should you come back. I don't. I really don't travel to New York now anymore unless I have to because it's so expensive and it's just yeah. a – it's a pain in the ass. I haven't been up there since 2016 when I went to radio. So you almost got a plan to be there for a weekend if you're going to go to a show because otherwise it's just insanely expensive to get in and get out. Um, yeah. But and it, I was thinking about that, that during the period when you guys weren't as high profile, you still were doing shows in like Woodbridge and Jersey and New York and in, in Louisiana, but you weren't doing any sort of national stuff. Um, no, no, no. We were and, doing uh, local area stuff. I mean, we'd venture out a little bit, still going to Houston, maybe a date in Florida here and there. Uh, but for the most part, doing, you know, South Louisiana and uh, and the Northeast, you know, right around New York City, the tri-state area. Yeah, and the trouble with that was, like, unless and, until the Internet came along, you just didn't know about those shows if you weren't local. That was the yeah. problem. So I didn't, you know, I, I think to myself, how the hell did I not see this? band more than twice like it just that, that that is in my head because i'm that guy i'll go to multiple shows but i just never knew about them or if i did i found out about it like later once you had the door which i don't know when you established that do you know when you established that the door.com yeah was that like oh, that was i mean think about this think about just the name itself the door.com it was that long ago i mean you know how many people have asked for that name no i no, I, really have you had a lot of people been at you? Oh, yeah. People, you know, hardware stores or religious groups. I mean, the religious groups, it's like crazy. They want Anybody control. pitch you a crazy offer? Like, hey, I'll give you a hundred grand for that name? Or? No, but, but we've always asked, you know. I'd always yeah. tell them I want a million dollars, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm not going to waste my time, you know. Hell no. Yeah, exactly. And when did you get it? Do you remember? Like, oh, three? Or was it not it was that early? Way back. Yeah, it was right at the beginning of the internet. The the, the thing was, was that zebra dot com was gone mm -hmm. and, but the reason was was because of that barcode company and they were like high tech you know high tech company and they had grabbed the name before uh we could get it you know uh, yeah the weird thing is there are a couple other zebras out there there's a weird band in europe that i think started in 
77 or something like that. So you guys would already, you'll have to look. I Because it's funny. I, I saw that, I came across that. I'm like, wait, what? Now there's ones later, much, much later. Yeah. There was that a, they have like Zebra XY or Zebra blah, blah, blah or whatever. But there is a band that's close to you guys. But I think timing wise, you're, you're in first on that. But it's like, it's weird. I didn't know that there were more Zebras out there. Well, we knew of a zebra that spelled the name with two Z's, Z Z E B R A, and they were really? a jazz. They were a jazz band, actually. Is that the European one I'm thinking of? I don't know. I don't. I, it seems to me they were from Canada, not uh, not uh, not. Let Europe. me look, let me look this up real fast because I, I wanted to. I point that out to you. Eh, it's not coming up. I'll send you an email on it. I'll, I'll find it because it came up. I'm like, what's this? This is weird. But um, so you're doing the you're doing the shows. There's gonna be a lot announced. Um, I have to ask it. You know, everybody asks you. People have been asking you for eighteen thousand years now, Randy. It's literally that long. When are we gonna see a new zebra album, man? I mean, oh, yeah. I know the labels aren't knocking your doors down probably and you're probably you know you're probably gonna be self-funding or somewhat self-funding a lot of this but you know you don't have to go into a giant studio anymore you can do it all in your yeah yeah you're at it right it's, there it's no excuse for not having it done at this point just you know getting old and uh just you know life yeah it's just one thing after the other but there's a ton of material we're doing it this year guy and i already started working yeah, he said you already tracked two songs. Yeah, already. yeah. We're, already, we're already on it. So it's going to be this year. You know, Where? But at this point, nobody's You're not going to say when. I wouldn't believe me if I was listening. Yeah, I, I got to be honest with you. I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> yeah. There's a song for you. There's a song title for you. Believe it when I see it. Yeah. Um, Should be the do the guys all live around you or not? No. The guy lives in Louisiana. Oh, okay. Uh, Felix and I live in Long Island. Okay, okay. And you, that's your studio, right? Your home studio? Yeah, this is uh, the newest studio I've got. I've had I've had my studio in different parts of my house. I don't have a, like a built studio. You know, I just you do have a all. mobile sort of thing. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. 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 Uh, last thing, I lied again. Last thing, I'm a gear guy. So I got to ask you about your gear. And then we'll get out of here. Okay. You, uh, you are known pretty much for that white double neck. BC Rich. What year is that, by the way? 1981. Okay, so that's an OG, uh, uh, an OG BC Rich. Because now they're owned by some Korean, yeah, conglomerate yeah, is, or something like that. Yeah, when Bernie had it. Yeah, this is when Bernie had it. Yeah, and I what, had um, uh, when I what got, did you play I, before? I'm sorry. I had BC Rich before, and they got stolen. I had a, I had a double neck. You know, it was uh, natural wood. Uh, okay. And I also had a I had a uh, Mockingbird Supreme. Mockingbird, okay, yeah. Mockingbird Supreme, yeah, and and they were both just wood. Uh, when when they got stolen in Houston, uh, we had to buy new equipment, so I bought a double neck and a a, a bitch at the same time. The red bitch, the red bitch. And they made right. them both at the same time. For okay. Them, they painted them at the same time, so they're matched. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're exactly matched. What were you playing before that? Like in the early seventies, were you, I had a Les Paul? Les Paul. Yeah, I was playing Les Paul. I also played an ES three forty five. Ah, BB King stereo. Yeah, you know, I had it cranked up with the Marshalls, and uh, and I, and I, I had a couple of Ibanez guitars that I had gotten. Uh, the knockoffs, you know. I think I had a Les Paul uh, copy, and mm -hmm. I think I had an Ibanez double Mac too back in nineteen seventy six. But um, but once I found the BC Rich, that I, I loved them so much, you know. I just yeah, and you stuck pretty true to them for the most part. Um, you do play. What's the black one over your shoulder there, though? Well, Michael Kelly is a guitar I'm playing now, and, and okay. I, you know, I've des designed the guitar uh, with Steve Pizzani at Michael Kelly, and so even my acoustic guitar I designed. So those are what I'm pretty much exclusively playing now. And you're doing a Michael Kelly acoustic as well? Yeah. 12 okay. yeah. I could have swore I saw you playing a Godin. No? No, 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 no. Okay. I think it's back here. I can grab it. Black, black too, right? Nope. Oh, oh man. Is that walnut? Um, you know, I 
the name is long and I can't even pronounce it, but it's an African wood and it's just okay. a veneer. Oh, it is veneer. Okay. Cause I was going to say, but, but the it's veneer, only... we, we tried like five different veneers and they make a huge difference in the way the guitar sounds. The resonance I'm sure. Yeah, right? It's, it's amazing. Yeah. I never, th I thought maybe I was like hearing things, but I would go back and forth between the guitars and it was really just the, 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 the resonance. The oh yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. I thought, the sound holes up here, there's no sound holes. Yeah, that's cool. I like that design. It's pretty wicked looking. Yeah. yeah. And that has electronics in it, right? Yeah. Yeah. What, what's in it? Is it uh, like a, his? This is a Fishman. Oh, it's Fishman. Okay. Yeah. With a with just one selection for your uh, EQ. You oh. Button in. Yeah. And it sounds great. Okay. Button, button out. And it's. They flat. don't have the faders and the levers. No. Yeah. I have one of those old uh, Balladeer. Like the first edition where they skinnied it from the fat body to the skinny body, they called it a thin body cutaway. Right, and that had the the you know the faders on it with the you know it's beat to shit now. I beat the hell out of that guitar. I tried to play like it was an electric, but I just got a Taylor, cup like two months ago, and I was playing the Koa, which is pretty salty. It's not a not a cheap guitar. No no Taylors are cheap, but um, yeah, I love that man. That Les Paul copy is gorgeous. Well, this is a this is a different one. Oh, it is thin thin line. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at that, so it's, man! It's great. it's great for the old guys. Yes, and, and it's a Michael Kelly and we're, is that we're purple? Going. Is that like a purple? Yeah, it's kind of a purplish color. Earth. If you get in a different light, it'll it'll turn brown, you know. But it's purple right here. Yeah, that's oh, killer, man. That's yeah, oh, that's gorgeous, man. That is really pretty. I got I got I got to look at them. I got um. I'm a PRS guy, so I cool. got a custom 22, and uh, also Dean. I've kind of really fallen in love with the uh, the Dean Cadillac. You remember them? Yeah. The the uh, Elliot Easton uh, the cars that I love. Most people are like that. That guitar shape is stupid. I'm like, I think it's the a killer guitar shape. So, um, but yeah, man. Well, look. How about amps though? Are you are you just strictly Marshall? I haven't, you know, I don't, I only use a Marshall for monitoring. All my sound comes from a Pod HD 500X. The rack, the rack job. No, it's the, it's the pedal. Oh, it's the, oh, is that, so it's, it's a foot. It's old, it's an old, old Pod, Pod HD 500X. I have the original 2.0. Do you remember that? The kids? Yeah, yeah. No, it's God, not that. Was a piece. They were a piece of shit, man. I hated those things yeah. at the time. But they they were like so cool. But now you go back and listen to those tones, you're like, ah, they're so grating, you know. Well, you can get some good tones out of these things, though. These days, you know the, the cool, cool. Stuff. Well, look, Randy, I I want to thank you so much for all the time you gave me today. Uh, again, everybody that's watching this now or or in the future, please go check the links here. Go check this band out live, man. They are. You know, I've often struggled to find a way to describe you, which is good. I mean, it, you know, it's a combo of yes, or not yes, uh, Rush and Triumph and and Zeppelin, man. I mean, it's just, if you like good classic hard rock, Zebra are that band for you. And these guys, they might be a little bit older these days, but I'm telling you, they're still kicking ass. They'll kick your ass if you go see them. So, um, everybody, thank you for being here. Randy, hang on one sec, and we'll, we'll wrap up, okay? Okay. Thanks, Joe.